but for now, uh, let's start with the first talk, which is an exact CP approach for the cardinality constrained Euclidean minimum sum of square clustering problem. Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation of an exact CP approach for the cardinality constrained Euclidean minimum sum of squares clustering problem. We are Mohamed Najib Hawass, Daniel Arouiz and Gilles Pezon from Polytechnique Montréal. As you may know, clustering is a useful automatic procedure in data analysis that facilitates extraction of useful information through grouping observations O into distinct mutually exclusive classes C. Different classes can be achieved by different clustering criteria. Among these is the widely used Euclidean minimum sum of squares clustering, which takes the form of the following program. In practice, solving the Euclidean MSSC represents finding the center CJ that minimizes cluster variance. So if MSSC is so reliable, why explore cardinality constraint variant of it? First, prior information could be known about the resulting classes, which can provide a significant boost to performance. This happens, for example, in image segmentation, work group composition, distributed clustering, and so on. Second, cardinality constraints reinforce the clustering process against poorly distributed data where general MSSC could produce groups that are either too large or too small or be influenced by outliers. In the rest of this presentation, we'll start by presenting the CP model corresponding to the cardinality constraint MSSC. We'll then talk about the two filtering algorithms as well as the search strategy we suggest to speed up CCMSSC resolution. Finally, we'll present an overview of the performance of our approach on widely used datasets. Starting with the CP model, we use a standard model that has first been proposed by Dao et al. in their previous work around CP and clustering. Here, xi are representative variables that link observation i to class C. And C is the cardinality of class C, and Z is the total within cluster sum of squares, which we want to minimize. These variables are linked by the following constraints, in particular an integer value precedence that breaks value symmetries. A regular constraint could achieve the same result, if available. The first part of our work are two filtering algorithms, a standard one and a more advanced, more thorough one for a global constraint to speed up resolution of the cardinality constraint MSSC. Both versions rely on computing the minimum contribution of each class to the objective Z at each point in the search tree. The global constraint that implements these filtering algorithms will filter both variables X as well as the objective Z. But before we go on to show how these algorithms work, it is important to present how the minimum contributions are calculated, preferably with a visual example. This first appeared in previous work by Dao et al. Suppose we have a partial group of three observations and three other unassigned observations. We'd like to compute the lower bound on the induced cost of this class if we introduce to it any two observations from the three unassigned ones. We start first by separating each unassigned point's contribution. The similarities between unassigned points are split evenly between both endpoints. That is, the blue dotted lines coming out of each free point are assigned half their weight. If we're to select only two points, we start by retaining only the smallest half distances since we're interested in a lower bound. Again, using the same logic, we only retain the two unassigned observations whose attached distances are smallest. Combining these assignments necessarily leads to a lower bound on the contribution of the class as we see here. In the basic approach we propose, we compute the lowest contributions of each class independently and then sum them up. This effectively enables the filtering of the objective. Once this is done, it is possible to recycle computations to calculate, in constant time, the lower bound on the cost of each individual assignment. Any time we exceed the cost of the incumbent solution, we filter the appropriate value of the corresponding representative variable. While this approach is simple and fast, it suffers from a major flaw. Since each class's contribution is computed locally, the same observation could be considered for two different groups, thus hindering quality of the bounds calculated. In the example you see, A is closest to both classes, but a better bound could be found using B for class C1. We need to devise a way to compute bounds globally. To achieve this, we derive a flow network from the bipartite assignment graph at each node of the search tree. In this network, 
All but the center arcs carry a cost, the cost of assigning the point on the left to the class on the right. All arcs have capacity 1 except those on the right which have capacity equal to the number of points required for the target cardinality of each group. Finding the minimum cost flow in this network is a tighter bound on the objective and can be used directly to filter it. Cost-based filtering of the representative variables is a bit trickier. For each variable value pair, we force flow through an arc to assume a specific assignment. If the new MCF cost is higher than the objective's upper bound, we proceed to the appropriate filtering. Recomputing the MCF every time is resource intensive and should be avoided. Fortunately, there is a way to recycle the solution of an MCF to carry out the cost-based filtering of the representative variables. We start by forcing flow through the arc that corresponds to the variable value pair under consideration. This necessarily leads to an infeasible configuration. But let's not stop here. This excess flow should result in a sort of reflux as shown. If we continue, we'll have the choice to send this reflux either in the arc above or the one below. For the sake of this example, let's send it above. This results in yet another infeasible configuration. We can continue doing this, sending this reflux flow back and forth until we reach the underfilled cluster as shown. If the path taken by the reflux flow is of minimum weight, the solution reached is a global minimum of the modified MCF. A more straightforward way to look at this is to run a minimum weight path algorithm on the residual graph as shown. This algorithm must support negative weight edges, making algorithms like Dijkstra's inadequate. Now that we have presented the constraint part of our work, let's talk about the equally important search strategy. We notice that the starting point of the search plays a crucial role in performance. In particular, starting off from a good, heuristically generated initial point can provide a significant boost to performance. Not only that, but the order of the initial decisions made in the leftmost branch impact the search as a whole. Moreover, ties can occur during the search process and these need to be addressed adequately. First, we propose two orders for the initial branching. Starting off from a heuristic solution, we introduce the decisions relative to it either by decreasing distances to own cluster center or by decreasing minimal distances to other cluster centers. These orderings are chosen because they place potentially disruptive, hard to assign observations near the root of the search tree, where we have a greater flexibility to recover from a bad choice. They also maximize the likelihood alternate branches will fail the closer they are to the top, eliminating bigger subtrees. The main search is similar to the one proposed by Dao et al. However, we observed that it suffers from a flaw in that it doesn't address ties which occur often in the search process due to empty clusters. We choose to supplement this search with a dynamic tie handling procedure, one that adheres to the fail-first principle by choosing the poorest points where to start new clusters. To test our approach, we implemented it using IBM iLog CPLEX Optimization Studio 12.9. For each run, we limit runtime to 24 hours on a single Intel Xeon Gold 6184 core with 1GB of RAM. Our code is freely available on GitHub. We selected 19 instances widely used in the literature to evaluate our algorithms. We first start with the impact of the tie-breaking strategy we adopted. Using only Dao et al's algorithm on a representative subset of the instances selected, our enhanced search shows substantial gains. In particular, breast tissue is solved in 184 seconds, down from 24 hours plus. Somewhat more visually, we notice more easily here reduced times across the board. As for the cardinality constraint problem, we notice that the advanced approach provides the best results even though the resolution of the MCF problems is substantially more resource intensive thanks to tighter bounds. Unfortunately, some instances are still intractable such as acute inflammations and connectionist bench. CPRBBA, the fastest CP method for the general MSSC has had significant difficulty solving even the simplest of instances. In an effort to make results more visual, we selected the five instances that all methods managed to solve and plot them as fails versus durations. 
Here, we notice for the OC ordering that the advanced approach produces the fastest results, while CPC, Dao et al's algorithm for the general MSSC which we supplement with the GCC, produces the slowest toward the top right corner. The same trend is observed here with the RC ordering. Between RC and OC, we notice that RC is overall faster with data points shifted toward the bottom left corner. However, it is important to remember that OC isn't definitively inferior as it produced substantially better results in some limited instances like breast tissue. Gaps paint a similar picture as well, where we observe lower gaps overall for the advanced method. We presented in our paper a new CP method to solve the cardinality constraint MSSC where we leverage the structure of the problem to achieve major speedups. We also noticed that tighter bounds should always be explored even if they turn out to be substantially more expensive to compute. A natural next step in our work is the exploration of soft cardinality constraints or other methods for even tighter bounds than the ones we were able to achieve with the advanced method. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, we have thankfully time for, and the windows are moving again, for a, a quick question. Um, one from Luis, how easy is it to adapt your pruning rules to consider different clustering criterion? For instance, the distance is just the Euclidean distance assuming your clustering point in a plane? Um, well, the, uh, the, the pruning strategy that we adopted is, uh, well, is fundamentally like, um, independent from the rest of the problem. So it should be easy to adapt it to any other, um, any other criterion. The thing is our, our pruning strategy has been um, specifically um, adapted to this particular problem. So it could maybe not work well for other problems, but it is easy to, uh, to change it just a little to make it work with other, with other criteria very easily because it, it, we made it in such a way that it is independent from the run of the other constraints and everything. I see. And Louis says, thank you. Uh, one thing that, not one thing, sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> one thing that uh, I noticed um, for the breast tissue, it seems like you have a dramatic improvement in performance. Do you have any insights on what might be the cause for that class of benchmark to do so much better compared to the other? Um, well, um, we, we can have maybe like conjectures about it, but what, what we thought happened is that the, uh, the, uh, the distribution of the points in the plane ha has made our, um, has made our fail first tie breaking, um, much more, uh, much more effective in that case, because maybe without the, uh, the tie breaking strategy, each, each time there is a, uh, there is a, um, a backtrack, maybe we choose at each time uh, a bad point from where to restart the search and this happens over and over and over again. So maybe um, uh, guiding the search in such a way that we eliminate these points very early on, these, these other places where to start new clusters uh, gives us a, a very, a very uh, substantial advantage in this case. Um, we, uh, we also had the same, um, the same results with other uh, instances, but not as dramatic, obviously. Uh, also the ordering of points has been, uh, has been very, uh, has had a, a significant impact, but on the, uh, on the cardinality constraint problem. Uh, so yeah, this is definitely maybe a, uh, an avenue for research to, to maybe, uh, build on it because, uh, as it stands, we have some idea about how uh, search works, uh, but obviously we need more, uh, uh, more robust strategies uh, going forward. Uh, all right, um, there is, I'm looking and, and Gilles actually has already answered to Emmanuel. So there was one more question, but mm -hmm. uh, it's handled. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Uh, let's give you a quick round of applause and move on to the next uh, paper, which, by the way, I'd like to um, give a heads up to everyone. It received a Distinguished Paper Award. 
Uh, so this paper is on primal heuristic for Wasserstein Barry Centers, hoping that I haven't destroyed that name too much. Uh, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to Pierre Yves, I imagine, for giving the talk. Hi everyone, thanks for your interest in my talk. My name is Pierre Yves Bouchet from Polytechnic Montreal, and I'm going to talk about a piece of research in optimal transport that I did with professors Stefano Guandi from the University of Pavia and Louis Martin Rousseau from Polytechnic Montreal. Before I start, I have a disclaimer. You will see on the slides in this video some technical details that I won't discuss. I assume that you can download the video or ask questions afterward. That being said, here we go. First of all, I will explain how do we see an image in optimal transport. Assume that we use grayscale images with dimension h times w. It will be seen as a grid where each pixel becomes a location and on each location, each point of the grid, we will have the pixel intensity, its luminosity, seen as a real in 0, 1, mu of x. The, it is in 0, 1 because we normalize over all the image. In addition to, sa to that, we will define a transportation cost from a location to another. Here, it is only the traditional Euclidean cost. This will be used because in optimal transport, we aim to find the most efficient, so the minimal transportation cost, to craft an image mu2 starting from image mu1. For example, with the two logos you see here, it will give something like that. We start from the first image, and as you can see on the video, the mass is moving slowly and continuously towards the second. This is interesting because we have a continuous number of intermediate images, intermediate interpolations, which can be seen as some weighted by centers between the two inputs. It is quite easy to compute, and again, it gives a by center, a notion of by center between two inputs. And as you see in the video, the more the weight you give to the second image, the closest you have to the second. But in general, you can define the Wasserstein by center of an arbitrary number of inputs, say n. It is defined as a new image nu, which minimizes the overall distance to all the inputs. And this is very interesting because it has some cool properties, as you see on these examples. Assume that we have some inputs which are all fuzzy or noisy images of the same object. Their Wasserstein by center will, will capture the key similarities between the image. So if, if I say it differently, it will give a sharp image representing what all the inputs are supposed to represent without the noise. So this is a very interesting theoretical object and this talk aims to compute an efficient way to find an efficient way to compute it. Okay, uh, we have some things already done. First of all, we know that the by center can be formulated as the problem you see just here I won't explain in detail what it means, but the important aspect is this problem is linear. Large, but still linear. So theoretically speaking, it's very easy to solve. In addition to that, we have some cool form reformulation of the problem, which makes the problem easier to solve it, to solve in practical context. So we can solve, we can compute the by center of a large amount of inputs optimally but still it's very long to compute, so there is a need for heuristics. The simplest heuristic we can think about is the Euclidean one. We use the formula to compute the by center of n points and mock it directly for images. It is very fast to compute once again, but however it does not work at all. As you see on these examples, the mass of the by center or pseudo by center is not represented is not located, it's not sharp at all, because the mass is spread everywhere, so the by center does not represent anything. There is a need for better heuristics. The first heuristic we developed used an alternative formula for the by center of points. As you can see here, the by center of n points can be computed recursively using the by center of n minus 1 first input, on which we had the last one. And we use this formula to, com to compute the first heuristic in that way. We start with the first approximation, theta1 equal mi1, 
and at each iteration k we have the current bicenter theta k minus 1 and we add into it the input mu k. This is interesting because at each iteration we compute the bicenter of only two inputs and as we have seen above it's quite fast and easy to do. So if we repeat this process until k equal m we obtain an approximation of the bicenter. We, there are some technical details using this heuristic, but notably we notice that the input ordering has an impact. So we tried some modifications, I won't explain them in detail. In the idea, at each iteration, we can pick the closest or fastest input to the current by center and add it into, the, into the, what we obtain, into the approximation. So this is the same idea with some variations. There is another possibility. Um, what we did before cannot be highly paralleled because it's only adding one input to the approximation. We can do something else, namely this computation. At each iteration, we group together two of the images and compute the bright center. Again, it is in fast and easy to do. So we we'll divide by two the number of remaining images at each iteration and we repeat this process until there is only one image. Obviously, we, the, there is a need to adapt the formula because at each iteration we can find an odd number of images, but this is quite easy to do in some technical detail. And once again, it's possible the input ordering has an impact, so we tried some variations like grouping together the two closest images or the two farthest and repeat this process until we have only one image, which is our approximation. Okay, so now we have all these heuristics. Let's see how it behaves on a practical dataset. The first one we use is MNIST and its neighbor, Fashion MNIST. I assume that you all know what it means. So if I, if I explain fastly, we have some unwritten digits centered and uh, we will pick from this uh, dataset only one digit, on all the images representing one digit and try to compute their bar center to see what we obtain. And we do the same idea for clothes in fashion analysis. So the results are interesting. On these, on these graphs, you have in abscissa the runtime and in ordinate the optimality gap. For each method, you have a given number of dots because we computed for a, vari a variable number of inputs from 10 to 2000. As you can see, obviously, the optimal is very is optimal, but very long to compute. While the heuristics are very close to optimality, the optimality gap, optimality gap can be lower than 1%, but it's faster to compute, like one order of magnitude faster. The only exception is the Euclidean, which is as fast as inefficient. The, all the other heuristics work well, Apparently there is one per far which works better. This one is the highly parallel where the inputs are grouped together uh, in the sense we pick the two farthest inputs together. So the results are interesting on this graph. And if we look at the outputs, it also works well. The sharpest images are consistent with the lowest optimality gap. Like if you look at the optimal in the first line, this is what we are supposed to obtain and the other lines are very close to optimality except in the Euclidean once again but still all the R6 give a result which is practically usable not optimal but very close to be optimal for MNIST it works well for fashion MNIST also uh, the inputs are all the outputs sorry are very close to what we expect to have there's just an interesting aspect. As if we look at the fourth column, the bicenter does not represent anything, but this is another problem which is not connected to what we mean. The important aspect is all the heuristics give a result which is close to the optimal one. But this is for easy datasets. We wanted to we want to test it to stress test for an, with an easy harder one. So we crafted translated MNIST. On this dataset, we start from MNIST images and we resize and translate it 
into a larger image. As you see here, with number 9, we have variable size and location of the digits. And we will use these larger images as inputs. So what do we obtain is also interesting. Once again, the computation time of the optimal it becomes very long. Here, the runtime are almost the same as before, but the number of inputs is way lower. While the heuristics, notably perfar, is still very efficient, the optimality gap is very close to zero, but the runtime is way faster, up to two order of magnitude faster. So this is an interesting heuristic. In this graph, I added another one, convo, which is a reference heuristic from the literature. I added it because it's a dual one, but still very used. Dual is an important aspect because it has no guarantee to be feasible. The output is not necessarily an image with uh, intensities summing to one. And as you see on the graph, there is a strange behavior with Convo because the algorithm stopped early because of technical reason. The algorithm depends on a parameter which is very hard to tune and it may lead the algorithm to fail. So this is another aspect which uh, shows that our parameter-free heuristic is very interesting because it has no risk of such a behavior. So if I, if I sum all my talk in one frame, we will obtain something like that. The optimal transport is a mathematical problem which is very useful for the, for the image processing. The Wasserstein-Barry Center has, has very cool properties. It can be computed efficiently in an uh, optimal way, but it's still quite long. But our heuristics are very, very close to optimality, way faster to compute, and as opposed to Convo, it is they are primal heuristics. So we are we have we have guarantees to obtain a feasible image, and our heuristics are parameter-free. So there is no risk to stop early because of technical reason. That being said, I will just add some references on which you can find more details or alternative approach of the problem and will thank you for your attention. I, if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Pierre-Yves, for, for your talk. Um, I'm looking to see if we have questions coming in, but I have one uh, that I'd like to actually uh, explore. Uh, th there is this thing called adversarial machine learning, where people are trying to create inputs that uh, are very difficult to properly uh, classify or to properly cluster. Um, do you have any insights whether the behavior of the of your heuristics for computing those Barry Center is would be more resilient? To these kinds of attacks? Yeah, that's kind of a, the idea we had. Uh, as we saw in the video, um, the Barry Center is quite, it, it, it resists well to some attacks because if you have a large number of inputs initially, if you just modify slightly one of them, the Barry Center almost does not prove at all. So yeah, that was the idea. If you already know more or less what we, what we expect, even noisy inputs, will not be that dramatic because the it's for such a distance to the device center won't move that much. Have you planned of making some comparison with deep neural network uh, working on the MNIST or another data set like that that would contain adversarial images? That, that was an idea. Uh, to be fully honest, we were just lacking uh, time to, to discuss more of these equations. But yeah, obviously, that will be a, a very interesting aspect. It would be to, cool to see. Yeah, just to, to know how well of relevant it is to compute the bar center. Yes, thank you. Uh, any other question? No. Well, All right, so you. let's thank Pierre Yves. And again, congratulations on the Distinguished Paper Award. And with this, let's move to the third paper in this session, which is uh, lossless compression of deep neural networks. And I imagine uh, Tiago might be actually the speaker. Hello, my name is Tiago Serra, and today I will talk with you about lossless compression of deep neural networks. This is joint work with Abhinav Kumar and Shrikumar Ramaligan. 
So we've been using neural networks for a lot of different things. And usually, the larger these neural networks are, the more accurate they become once we train them. Now, every neural network is basically modeling a function from input space X to an output space Y. So one logical question that we may ask, especially given the resource constraints that we may have, is whether we can find a smaller neural network in certain cases that represents exactly the same function. Because if you can do that, that means that we can obtain a lossless compression. We're reducing the size of the neural network, but we're not losing accuracy because we're presenting exactly the same function. And we can make this question easier to answer if we consider that not all possible inputs are relevant. In a given application, we might have certain inputs that, that will be uh, relevant and others that won't. For example, if we think about the MNIST dataset, in the MNIST dataset, we have 28 by 28 pictures, and in every pixel, we have a value between 0 and 1. So it doesn't really matter to me what happens if you test an input where one of these variables is greater than 1 or smaller than 0, because that will never happen in practice. In the scope of this work, we're looking at feedforward neural networks, which are the most commonly used, and we're looking at the most type, commonly used type of activation, which is the rectified linear unit. The output of the rectified linear unit is given by the maximum between zero and then a fine transformation of its inputs that takes a vector of weights and a bias into account. And in resemblance to what a biological neuron would do, we say that the unit is inactive if we're seeing a zero output, so there's no signal going forward. And we say the unit is active when we're seeing a positive output, in which case the maximum term of this expression is the second one. And one thing that's very interesting about rectifier networks is that they always model piecewise linear functions. In other words, whenever we're performing, whenever we're training a rectifier network, we're basically performing a piecewise linear regression. And we can imagine that the more pieces this function can have, the easier it gets to fit the training data and potentially obtain better results with the test data. But there are certain things that we don't fully understand that until now. The first one is, what's the family of piecewise linear functions that we can obtain with such a regression? So if we fix the parameters of the neural network, can we tell which piecewise linear functions can be represented? We don't fully know that. And second, and this is what we're going to discuss in this work, is whether we can find a smaller neural network that defines exactly the same function. And each one of these pieces is a part of the input space that we call linear region, because in that part of the input space, the neural network behaves linearly. So it's as if we have a linear function for that part of the input space, which will correspond to each one of these slopes in the pictures that we have in this slide right now. Now, these linear regions can be connected to the concept of stability as well. In each one of these linear regions, we're going to see a different signature of units that are active and inactive. If it happens that across all the linear regions defined by a neural network, we always see a given unit being active or inactive in all of them, that means that we have a stable unit. When a unit is stable, that means that we can potentially simplify the neural network. For example, we can have a stably inactive unit. In that case, we have a unit that never produces a positive output. So for any relevant input for us, for example, in MNIST, any 0, 1 vector in 784 dimensions, if we just send anything like that through the neural network, and we always get an output of 0 for a particular unit, no matter what, that means that the unit is stably inactive. Conversely, we can say that the unit is stably active if no matter what input we send through the neural network, the output of this unit is always positive and given as an affine transformation based on the weights and the bias of that unit. And in both of these cases, the absence of a non-linearity in the unit, because we, that maximum between zero and the affine transformation is not really there. We're, only, we're either always mapping everything to zero or everything to the affine transformation. That means that we can actually simplify the neural network. So here are some examples in which we can do that. Let's say, for example, that we have some units that are stably inactive. Let's say we have these two red units in red here. 
in the near network. That means that the output of this unit is zero. So whatever comes from this unit to the next to the next layers is always a zero. So we can ignore the output of those units. And as a consequence, we can easily remove them from the neural network. Now, let's look at a more sophisticated example. Let's say that we have three stably inactive, stably active units in the same layer. And let's say that if we just create a matrix with the weights of these units, the rank of this matrix is true, which means this matrix is rank deficient. In that case, the output of one of these units can be fully defined by the output of the other two. So if we just adjust the weights of the units accordingly, we could remove one of them and have the neural network represent the same mapping from inputs to outputs. Now let's look at some more extreme examples. Let's say that all units in a given layer are stably active. If that's the case, there is no nonlinearity in this layer, and we can as well directly connect its inputs to its outputs by just adjusting the weights accordingly. And that's what we call folding the layer. So we're just removing one of the layers because it's stably active. If we look at the other example where all the units in a given layer are stably inactive, in that case, it means that for any inputs of the neural network, we're mapping to intermediary point 0, 0, 0, 0. And as a consequence, we can say that if the neural network models a constant function, and we can drop all the hidden layers in this case. Of course, that's a very extreme example. But in this case, we can collapse the entire neural network. Now, how are we going to determine that these units are stable? We're going to do that using mathematical optimization. So we're going to first define a formulation to map inputs to the outputs for every one of the units. So we say that this affine transformation of the inputs of the unit will be equal to this variable g, which we can define as our pre-activation output. Now g will be equal to the output, post-activation output h, minus the output of a complementary fictitious unit h bar, such that either the real unit is active or the fictitious one is active. Both these units are loose, so they have a, an output that's not negative. And then we have this binary variable telling whether the unit is active or not, and that will limit the output of the unit or of its complement. Graphically, this is what we're doing. If we have a negative value for the preactivation output, then the binary variable will be equal to zero and h will be equal to zero. If we have a positive value for the preactivation output, then h equals g and the variable z equals one. And now that we have this mapping for each one of the units, we can define an optimization problem over the entire neural network to determine which units are active or not. So for every unit, we can try to maximize the pre-activation output G subject to the input-output mappings of all the previous units and the domain of the inputs. And if by solving this problem, we obtain a negative value, that means that the unit is stably inactive because we're never going to produce a positive value. And in this case, we don't have to find an optimal solution for this problem. As long as we find a negative upper bound, we can tell that the unit is stably active no matter what input. And we're going to do the same thing to determine if a unit is stably active. But now what we're going to do is minimize this variable g, subject to the input-output mappings of previous units and the bound. And if this value is positive, that means that the unit is stably active, that no matter what happens, we're always going to produce a positive value with this unit. And in this case as well, we don't have to find an optional solution. If we find a positive lower bound, we're done. And in both cases, we can use mixed integer linear programming to determine the stability of the units. And there are some ways in which we can push the units to be more stable. The first one uh, uh, is when we have restricted domains. So if we're talking about a smaller domain, for example, only values between zero and one, instead of any possible value, that's a local stability, but that might be all that we need. We might, of, of course, like the smaller the domain is, the easier it is to identify stable units. And we can also induce sparsity in the neural network by training it with regularization. Let's say, for example, that we use regularization on the weights. If the values for the bias are much larger than the values for the weights because we have regularization on the weights, then 
A negative bias is likely to make a unit being stably inactive, and a positive bias is likely to make a unit being stably active. Now, here's some results from experiments that we have run. Each one of these experiments we train 31 networks with different levels of regularization for each particle and two hidden layers. So here are the results when we have two hidden layers with 25 units each. As you can see, um, the more regularization we use from the, from the bottom to the top of the table, the more compression we obtain because we're inducing uh, the weights to be smaller than the bias. And one thing that's interesting here is that in the intermediary row, which is where the amount of regularization is actually improving accuracy, we already see some compression going on. So we're training these neural networks, we're measuring the accuracy that we get with them, and then we're compressing them while preserving that accuracy. Now, if we increase the layer width from 25 in the two hidden layers to 50, we also see a similar behavior. We see that if for, for an amount of regularization where accuracy improves, we already see compression. And then, of course, if we put more and more regularization, we're going to see more compression, but then we might be losing some accuracy. And we also see the same pattern going on when we have layers with a width of 100. And you can see that the run times are getting larger and larger. And that's one of the things that we want to explore in future work, which is how we can solve these problems faster so that we can scale this method to larger neural networks. So that's what I had to say about this work. This fits in a bigger scheme of research that have been doing with Chirikumar Ramaligan, Abhinav Kumar, Christian Tushat Madraja. So you can see some previous work that we did at ICML and Triple AI. This paper at CPAOR, we have another preprint on archive and a blog post where you can see a little bit more about this correspondence between neural networks and piecewise neural regressions. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much, Thiago. Um, okay, so we have time for uh, one or two questions. So please uh, bring them up. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, one from Daniel. So the stability units are found by the MIP, is that true? Yes, by solving the MIPs, we can tell if the units are stable or not. All right. One thing I was thinking about is that, and I'm not a deep neural network expert, is that um, sometimes having uh, multiple units that are doing the same thing helps with the robustness of the, of the neural network. Uh, when you do compression, even if it's lossless, you, you potentially remove that redundancy. Have you actually looked into the potential effect uh, of this by evaluating on larger uh, test set? So in the particular way in which we're doing it here, it wouldn't change anything because we're only removing units if we can preserve the same outputs being produced by the neural network. So I can imagine that there would be cases where you have units that are very similar, but they might be doing slightly different things in order to create some robustness. In cases like that, we wouldn't be removing them. Okay, good. That's the, the key you. contribution here is that we're not sacrificing accuracy in any way to achieve this compression. And that because of that, we're not compressing as much as other papers in the literature because we're preserving exactly the function that's modeled. Okay, so, so you only eliminate if they're strictly identical. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. Uh, or maybe uh, um, Daniel uh, elaborated a little bit, asking uh, on the questions like, are they found by the MIP? She's uh, adding, uh, with respect to every possible input, is that true? Yes. I mean, to solve the MIP, we usually we have to bound these inputs. But for example, if we're talking about MNIST, that means that we have a variable representing every um, every 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 input that you receive, for example, in the MNIST, we have 784 different inputs. We have a variable for each one of them going from zero to one. And when we're determining stability, if we find out that the unit uh, is stable or, or like it's not stable, uh, the solution will give us a certificate, it will give us a solution where the unit is not stable. So like the formulation, uh, the formulation is like has fixed weights and biases, but the inputs can vary. So those are the decision variables actually the activations and what are the inputs causing those activations. Okay, got it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, now with this, um, yeah, she, Daniel really likes it, so go read the comment. Uh, please go on uh, with the discussion in the Q&A session. Uh, and we are going to have one last short talk, no Q&A after this one. Uh, this is about learning optimal classification trees, strong max flow formulation. But of course, a round of applause for Tiago. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sina Ali, a grad student at the University of Southern California, and today I'm going to talk about our recent work on learning optimal classification trees, strong Maxwell formulations, which is a joint work uh, with Andres Gomez and Philip Williams. Uh, in our work, the goal is to derive optimal classification trees. In, a, in such a problem, uh, we have some internal nodes that we perform a test and we have uh, leaves on the trees that we make a prediction on them. And the goal is to select these tests and the labels that we predict such that we maximize the uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, we have heuristics such as CART or C4 uh, to get decision trees. These are like fast heuristics. Uh, on the other hand, we have MIP-based methods uh, to produce decision trees. Uh, these uh, methods, uh, they're not as fast as the heuristics, but they produce optimal solution, and they also have this modeling power that we can easily incorporate different constraints such as fairness uh, to the formulation. In our goal, uh, in, in our work, the goal is to strengthen these models such that, that we could improve their performance. To do that, we start with converting the decision tree into a, a cyclic directed graph by introducing a source node and a sync node. Uh, uh, on the internal nodes, we need to choose what feature to branch on. And for the terminal nodes, we need to predict the class. So these are the decision variables for the MIP formulation. And having these variables, they use a, a graph for each data point. And this graph, individual graph, coming from the fact that when a data point lands on a node, we either go to left or right. And at each leap, we can move forward only if we are correctly classified. So a correct classification happens when we have a path from, us, from the source to the sink, which is equivalent to a max flow of one. Uh, uh, one major result that we have is that uh, our proposed approach has a stronger LP relaxation than OCT, which is state-of-the-art approach. And in the numericals, we show that we are seven times faster than this approach. Another important characteristic of our approach is that it has a nice decomposable structure. So when we fix the structure of the tree, i.e. the features to speed on the prediction, then uh, we can solve a max flow problem for each individual data point separately. And we only need to check if they are correctly classified. If yes, then we're good. If no, uh, it means that we have a violated constraint, and then we need to add this violated constraint back to the main problem, and then iterate until we converge. So here, instead of solving the max flow, we solve the dual of, of it, which is a mean cut problem, and we show that all the cuts that we add to the main problem during this process are facet defining, meaning that all of them are all of them are necessary for defining the convex hull of feasible a feasible region. So in the numericals here uh, we show uh, the number of instances solved to optimality in a given time. And as you can see, our proposed approach, flow OCD and its benders decomposition, can solve uh, a greater number of uh, instances to optimality in a given time. So in more detail, flow OCT is seven times faster than uh, OCT because of the stronger LP relaxation. And when we use a decomposition, we are five times uh, faster than the flow OCT. So here we have a similar figure, but this time we include imbalanced trees as well. And again, we see uh, the same trend that vendors and flow OCT outperform 
the, the state-of-the-art approach. Uh, these are the references that we had for our talk today. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be more than happy to address your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sina, for this talk. Um, let me remind everyone that there are now uh, two Q&A sessions running uh, from 4.20 to 4.50, one for each of the machine learning sessions we had this morning. So uh, go to the program uh, to find the links to each one of these. And with that, let's wrap up. Thank you very much to all the speakers for uh, such a great time. See you next time. Bye-bye.